How are Kevin Rumley's device, Scott Bloomquist, and Ricky Thornton Jr. connected? We'll talk about that today, plus some late model chassis swaps, a first for Brandon Shepard, some Sprint Car Championship updates, and more. Let's go. It's Sunday, August 27th. I'm Justin Fiedler. This is Dirt Tracker Daily. Before we get rolling, I wanted to give a quick shout out to all of the channel members on YouTube. We've had a bunch of additions to that list in the last few months, and your support is very much appreciated. Big thanks to new members Brian, Lee, Justin, Dayton, Edward, David, Barefoot Nelly, Brian T, Eric, Venom Dragon, Danny, and Sean. If you watch all the way to the end of these uh, daily shows, you'll see a list of names, and those are all of the folks who throw in a few bucks a month to help keep me rolling. If you want to check out that program for yourself, click any of the join buttons on the channel and the videos, or visit youtube.com slash dirt tracker slash join. Perks of channel membership include loyalty badges and custom emojis to get, you know, you can use those in the chat or the uh, comment section. You always get 10% off dirt tracker merch, and you get a free sticker when you sign up. Appreciate everyone that is a part of that program. We'll kick today off with an interesting conglomeration of things that have happened in dirt lay model racing in recent days that are all sort of connected. Back on Friday, Flow Racing released one of their videos in the Road to Eldora series that's leading into this year's World 100. In that video, Ben Shelton visited Kevin Rumley's shop in Lexington, North Carolina to talk about the infamous device that Rumley used on his car in 2015. Jonathan Davenport won the Lucas title that season in the Rumley 6, and they took down a bunch of crown jewels along the way. That included the Dream in the World, the Show Me 100, the USA Nationals, North South 100, the Prairie Dirt Classic, and more. In all, it was 23 wins in 60 starts. If you've been a Dirt Land Model fan for any length of time, you've probably seen the photos of the device and know about its mystique. The piece of tech that Rumley created was run on the left rear of the car, but was eventually banned after that 2015 season. It was a huge talking point at the time because everybody wanted to know what it was, what it did, how it worked, all of that. In most places I've seen comments from Kevin about the device, he's usually still pretty cagey and secretive, even to this day. And you thought maybe this flow video would be the time where he would open up and tell us a little bit more about what it was and how it worked and all of that, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. In the interview, we learned that Rumley's parents gave him a data acquisition system for Christmas in 2010, and because it was legal to run them back then, he was able to discover a problem with the cars that the device could help them solve. The invention went through multiple iterations before they decided in the lead up to that 2015 season to actually use it. They were fast out of the gate with it, but it wasn't a magic bullet. Even with all the success they had, there was still plenty of bad luck along the way and some not great finishes. Rumley would not reveal to Shelton what that problem was that he discovered, but did say the device was meant to disconnect the left rear tire from the rest of the car. And he, the reason he won't tell him what it is is because it's still a problem and something that hasn't been solved under this current rules package. The whole situation uh, in 2015 certainly caused a big stir all season, and regardless of what you believe or not, it did seem to have a big effect on their performance. Without it in 2016, Davenport was still very good, uh, winning 22 times in 88 starts, but they didn't win the Lucas title, and they didn't repeat all of that crown jewel success. That 2016 season, though, turned into a dominant one for Scott Bloomquist. He bagged 15 wins in 45 Lucas starts and won the Lucas title by nearly 900 points over Davenport. It was Bloomer's third series title, and for all intents and purposes, it was his final National Series championship of his career. Where this all ties back together is with Ricky Thornton Jr. last Thursday night at Georgetown. RTJ went six to the lead in just six laps late in that race and picked up his 16th series win of the year, which broke Bloomquist's record from 2016 for the most Lucas wins in a single season. Bloomer also had 15 uh, Lucas wins back in 2011. And I've had this on my notes for several days to check into where RTJ's season stacks up against those in the past, but obviously now we know. He's right in there with Davenport's device season and Bloomer's last title run, and he's doing it driving a chassis that Kevin Rumley has had a huge hand in developing over the years through Longhorn and Bill Stein. It's always cool to follow some of these threads and see how events and people all tie back together. If you want to watch that flow video on the device, uh, it's available on YouTube for free. I'll link to it in the video description below. And after Georgetown on Thursday, Lucas went to Port Royal on Friday and Saturday. Hudson O'Neill ended up with the $50,000 score last night after a great battle all race long out front and included O'Neill, Davenport, Mike Marler, Brandon Overton, RTJ. 
Thornton had to start at the tail after swapping to a backup car because of motor, uh, motor issues. He got all the way to second uh, before uh, he then bowed out under a caution with 10 to go because of more engine issues. I do think he was fast enough to win, and a 25th to the victory charge would have been epic. Uh, headed to Portsmouth and Tyler County next weekend, Overton has retaken that fourth and final spot in the chase standings thanks to strong finishes at both Georgetown and Port Royal. Tim McCready is just 45 points out, though. At Davenport over the weekend, we were probably in line for a uh, Bobby Pierce a three-night sweep, which uh, would have been more of the same from what we've seen from that uh, team and driver this year. But he had a uh, lap 59 flat tire on Saturday night. Pierce gave up that top spot to get that tire fixed, and Brandon Shepard was able to capitalize. It was actually Shepard's first outlaw uh, official outlaw win of the year, which I think is a bit surprising. I would not have guessed when the season started that it would take him until August 26th of this year to get his first outlaw victory. He twice won prelim features, and he's got two big Lucas wins this season, but this feels like maybe a little bit of pressure off there. Uh, Pierce was able to race back to a top 10 finish in ninth, and his championship lead remains pretty safe right now, 116 over Chris Madden. Speaking of Madden, he was in a new Longhorn chassis this weekend, and it seemed to pay off. He led laps both Friday and Saturday, and I guess if you can't beat him, join him. Uh, and same is true of Tyler Bruning. He switched to a Longhorn from a Capital, and there are rumors out there about the future of Capital and that Skyline team. The Outlaws head to Mississippi Thunder and Deer Creek next weekend. On the sprint car side, Logan Schuhart swept the Outlaw weekend in North Dakota. He got around Sheldon Hoddenshield with just a few laps to go on Friday at River Cities to win, and then Saturday night led flag to flag at Red River Valley. An 11th place finish on Friday wasn't what David Gravel needed, but a second on Saturday was a step in the right direction. That second on Saturday was his first top five in an outlaw points race since winning at Weed Sport on July 30th. With the West Coast uh, looming now, Brad Sweet's lead over Carson Macedo grew just a little bit. It's now 56 points. Gravel is 66 back in third. Even though Sweet hasn't won with the Outlaw since June 30th at Cedar Lake, he's it feels like he's very much in the driver's seat right now for this Outlaw Championship uh, and what will be his fifth straight. We'll see if Macedo or Gravel can somehow get hot. They'll have to combine that with some issues with Sweet. I also think we should pay attention to the distractions uh, for Sweets, uh, some of his extracurricular activities, if any of that has any sort of effect uh, on his performances down to world finals. In the all-star title fight, things swung in Tyler Courtney's favor on Saturday night at Butler. Zeb Wise dominated the Friday race at Tri-City and was maybe headed for another win last night, but he tangled with the lap car of Reese Saldana with 15 to go and was out of the race. Sunshine took advantage, scored the win. With just eight race nights remaining, the Clawson Marshall team has edged ahead by eight points for the owner's title, and that is the, uh, the one that really matters on the all-star side. It's the one that pays the big money. Attica is up next for the all-stars. At Kokomo for SmackDown, it was a big weekend for Justin Grant. He won all three nights and pocketed nearly $60,000 for his efforts. It's been a bit of an up-and-down year for JG, but the Kokomo weekend brings him right into the mix for that series title. He trails Brady Baker right now by only nine points. USAC Sprint Cars are now off for a few weeks. Other weekend winners included Zach Dom and Gavin Miller with the Extreme Outlaw Midgets. Kenna McIntosh leads Jade Avedisian right now by 23 points for that title. ASCS National Tour foes Matt Covington and Jason Martin traded wins over the weekend at Lakeside and Salina. Brent Marks was a winner Friday at Williams Grove. Chase Dietz won Saturday at Lincoln. Aaron Reitzel won at Knoxville, while Austin McCarl is the 410 track champion. A Chase Randall, Kid Higday were your other Knoxville champions. In late model action, Joseph Joyner and Michael Page will hunt the front series winners. Josh Rice bagged the 15 grand with the Ironman series at Lake Cumberland. Peyton Freeman was a $10,000 winner at Sugar Creek. And Donald McIntosh bagged 7500 bucks with the Ultimate Southeast series. Uh, that's it for the show today. Hope you guys have a good rest of your Sunday out there. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. 